we are. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's convening of Resilience Hubs. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you. My name is Ashley Kirkwitz. I am the chair of the Economy Stream, and I did want to recognize our our chair of Resilience Hubs, Maggie Kahoiloa, who's also joining us today and will be helping me to host this meeting. So to set the tone for today's conversation, we usually start with our grounding statement. So I'll go ahead and call on folks that are on the call to help us read through this. Keone? Uh, you just want me to read what I see here? Yes. All right. Vibrant Hawaii is a growing community that commits to individual and collective um, Aomo Kuliana to increase equitable opportunities to build wealth an abundant reservoir of human, social, natural, and financial capital that we contribute and draw upon. Thank you. Keiko? Sure. Our kuleana is to convene conversations so that all va travel toward a common goal, build community awareness, will, and action from foundation of our shared values, shift deficit narrative systems and policy that perpetuate poverty and inequity, and implement strategies that are developed and resourced by the community and reflect native intelligence. Thank you. Maggie? We value equity and belonging, and we demonstrate this by being willing to let go of assumptions and biases about each other, speaking up when we recognize barriers that prevent us from participating, prospering, and reaching our full potential, promoting full family engagement and participation, and raising our own and our collective belief that wealth, abundance, and prosperity is not a pie. More for others does not mean less. Thank you. Resilient Oahu. Uh, and we demonstrate this by acknowledging that aloha is unique to Hawaii. It is from this place. By valuing aloha, we value the vast and unique genius of the people of Hawaii, and we prioritize the knowledge, skills, and solutions of its people, recognizing that aloha is an action modeled to us by our environment, and we validate its aloha through aloha aina and our willingness to suffer a little so that no one has to suffer a lot. Thank you. Ronit? We value Au Amo Kuliana, and we demonstrate this by a commitment to empowerment rooted in our belief that everyone has skills and abilities, but needs circumstances and opportunities to express them, promoting language that recognizes a person's abilities and shared ownership and accountability. If any one of us stumbles, we all fall because we all are connected. Thank you. Devin. Devin, you need to unmute yourself. There I am. Sorry. First okay. of all, thank you for letting me join. Um, we value flexibility and learning, uh, which leads to transformation. And we demonstrate that being honest without shame, we do not know courageous, adaptive leaders, uh, even when it calls for difficult conversations. And even when our outcomes look like failure, demonstrating Hui Nui and Ha Ha Ha. ha Ah, as we hold tension to achieve change and practicing makawalu and acknowledging that we hold uh, each one piece that is a part of something bigger. Thank you so much. All right, at this time, I'm going to be launching our participant poll and then we'll segue into one minute introductions. Um, so I'll launch the poll now. And it, you need to respond to every single question in order for you to submit. So I'll give you a couple minutes to complete that. It should show up on your screen.
Just waiting for a couple more folks to finish up. All right, thank you to all who participated. Okay, does everyone see the results on their screen? <laughs> Number of individuals who consider themselves as leads and keys. We have a lot of weavers in this conversation, people that see themselves connecting others in their network to this work, as well as folks that have an interest in this topic or something to contribute a resource, information, access, or skills. Um, many folks joining us on today's Zoom are engaged citizens. It's so great to see you. And all sectors are represented, business, philanthropy, education, government, social service, and even faith. Thank you. Um, we also have excellent representation from around Hawaii Islands. And we also have a couple of folks that are joining us from other islands. So it's great to see everyone and so much diversity in today's conversation. We have um, a few people that have identified themselves as Kapuna, as well as two people that have identified themselves as youth. So thank you all for joining us for today's conversation. The next thing that I wanted to do, because we have a number of folks that um, you know are new to this, new to this conversation, new to this work, but also have been joining us over the last few months uh, to take part in Resilience Hub's conversations. And so before we segue into a presentation by Keiko Mercado, she's with our county planning department to give us an overview of our county general plan and community development plan updates, as well as how resilience hubs fit into that. I wanted to give everybody about a minute to introduce themselves. And if you take a look at the screen, there are a number of areas um, and think about what you submitted for the poll. Within your introduction, you know, your name, uh, the organization that you're with, you know, where you're from, um, and the kinds of um, work that you see for yourself contributing to this effort. So are you a lead? And if so, how can you be leading in the Resilience Hub effort? If you're a key and have substantial expertise, what sort of expertise can you share? Same thing for supporting, leading, and interest. We just wanna get a sense of who is part of this call and how we can leverage you in all of this collective work. Um, I don't have my fancy timer on my screen because the county's internet sucks here. So if you could all do me a favor and set a one minute timer on your phone, um, that ensures that everybody is going to stay on track and that we have equitable amount of time for everyone. All right, Keiko, can I go ahead and start with you? Sure. It's all finding right. my timer. Uh, I apologize for the barking dog. You're fine. Um, so my aloha, my name is Keiko Mercado. I'm a long range planner in the planning department. Um, I am calling in from Volcano this morning um, as most of us are still working um, from home. Um, I think that there are different, um, different areas that I can connect with depending on um, kind of what's happening. And so given our presentation today relative to the general plan and the CDPs, um, that's kind of our area of expertise, um, but also in working with action committees around the island, we can help to weave and connect others into the work that's being done um, already in uh, community. And so excited to be here and appreciate the opportunity to be a part of these conversations. Mahalo. Thank you, Keiko. Keone? Uh, aloha, everyone. Uh, my name is Keone Kealoha. I'm joining from Waikiki. Um, I uh, work with a nonprofit, Kanu Hawaii. It's been around since around 2006 or seven. Uh, we do some work, resilience work, mostly community engagement work um, here on Oahu, but across Hawaii. Uh, and then I kind of came into this work. Uh, I was a co-founder of Malama Kauai and was involved in the 2018 kind of flood response part, which has kind of introduced me to this. And that's how I ended up meeting folks like Ashley and um, some other folks from Pulo Um And so I have an interest, you know, but uh, again, I'm not on your folks' island, but I'm really interested that you're now taking this into 
kind of the government space and getting more integrated community and government, which is where we have to move with this for it to be successful. So thanks for letting me be on today. Thanks, Kione. Um, resilient Oahu. Good morning. Uh, I'm Chris Cunningham. I work for the city and county of Honolulu, the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resilience. We are uh, Last year, we developed uh, the city's uh, resilience strategy, and one of the actions was to uh, develop a resilience hub action plan. So uh, long story short is I wrote a FEMA grant to get some funding to develop that plan. Uh, and so we're working towards that and um, obviously very interested in, in the work that's happening that you all are doing. So I listed myself as, as lead because uh, I'm lead on the, the, this planning project. So uh, I'm excited to learn uh, and what you guys have going on. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. Ronit? Aloha, Kako. Um, and Ashley, it's wonderful to see you again. I met you at the Hub two years ago, um, where I was blessed with Auntie Verni or Auntie Verna giving me the name Mele, which is actually what my name means in Hebrew. So you can call me either. Um, I work for a nonprofit social service agency called Parents Inc. Um, our program actually predominantly deals with parents um, who are dealing with the child welfare system. And we provide uh, counseling, uh, skill building visits and parent educations to um, support parents towards reunification. Uh, we do not have many referrals and I, my office, I, have a, I am the supervisor of a satellite office in Ka'u um, in Na'alehu. As soon as I heard about the Resilience Hub, I got in touch with Michelle Galimba and I've had a, with whom I met um, actually through photography years ago. And um, I've been going to their hub, um, which has started running and seeing how, because we don't have many referrals, so that means more time, how we can support their hub um, to, you know, to serve the community. Um, I put myself down as key, I don't know, maybe I'm somewhere between support. Um, my focus as a clinician has, uh, I love community organization and program development. I've actually done more of that than counseling clinical work. And, um, you know, my work as a counselor, my work as a photojournalist, the reason I was drawn to the hub is because the hub was a symbol of resilience. And I am very much into um, hearing more, uh, shifting the vocabulary in terms of res resilience instead of trauma. I liked what you said about um, something about a narrative, uh, the deficit narrative, and that we move away from that. Thank you, Ronnie. So, Good to see you. Really appreciate it. Great to see you. Yeah, thank you. Devin, one minute to introduce yourself. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. I uh, have an area of expertise in education and particularly um, environmental education. I have a lifetime experience. Um, recently was displaced from my job um, and uh, am now um, currently uh, sorting myself out in terms of how I might reinvent myself. And I'm particularly interested in sharing my expertise in environmental education, perhaps through the hub to reimagine what it means for education now that we've gone through this um, displacement of our, our usual routines in education and to imagine what, um, uh, what that might mean in terms of outdoor education right here in Hawaii. I have resources and connections and network all around the world. Um, a third of my career was overseas. And so I have many connections um, across the world and, and um, I'm hopeful that uh, I might find my place in this, in this, in this in environment. So thank you for inviting me to be here today. Thank you, Devin, for joining us. Heather, one minute, go ahead. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Heather Kimball. Um, I'm involved in a couple of the other vibrant Hawaii streams and, and was initially involved in this one, but it just became too much to do this too. Um, I wanna give a big shout out to Ashley and Maggie um, what you've done here is just a wonderful example of taking something from idea to action. And I'm just so impressed with how much you guys have been able to accomplish in such a short amount of time. Um, it's really fabulous and it's so good for our community. Um, I wanted to jump on today 
Uh, one of the things that I'm involved with through Think Big Hawaii, and I'll put a link to that in the chat, is discussions around remote work, um, particularly providing opportunities for remote work for people who've been recently unemployed or pathways for remote work for our young folks. And one of the things that we'd like to do is, is conduct a survey to see what sort of resources people have at home, internet access and hardware devices. Um, and we wanna ask the Resilient Hub Hui to, um, there's my timer, um, to, to do a sur survey in the hub so that we can ask um, if folks have devices or internet access. So thank you for that, Ashley. Thanks for joining us. We're happy to share that information and contribute to your survey. Maggie? Good morning, I'm Maggie Kohailua. I am co-chair of Resilience Hubs. Most of you folks know me. I also am surety for Hawaii Island. I don't wanna take up much time, but I do want to congratulate everyone on our team for a job so well done. And I'm just so thankful for all of you folks. Um, Ashley and I will continue looking at ways that we can support hubs through this first phase. Um, and I'm here to listen and um, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Laurie? Get my timer going. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Laurie Farron, and I am actually part of the Waimea Hub. Um, and Lauren wasn't able to make it today and asked me to step in and just kind of keep her informed on what's going on. Um, I consider myself probably key and support. I have developed. Um, internship programs and uh, community mentor programs uh, based in trauma-informed care. And I'm just um, trying to get it out there, especially at this time with the trauma that we're going through with COVID for communities that need support. So, um, and I'll um, put my information also in the chat. So if there's anybody that has any questions or would like more information, they can get a hold of me. And thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Laurie. Bennett? Morning. Let me get the timer going here. <laughs> Good morning. I'm uh, Bennett Dorrance. Uh, I live up in Kohala, and for some years we've had uh, my wife and I've been working on something called the Kohala uh, Village Hub, and its main focus has been in education. Uh, and we have themes of food, arts, culture, and ecology. So we've been trying to provide education and, and opportunities through the hub uh, in those areas uh, or else, and we've had focus areas like uh, on the food side, there is a food hub in Kohala uh, that uh, is aggregating and distributing food. And in some respects, thanks to COVID, it really got a huge boost and it's been very active. Um, because we have this focus on government, uh, I'd, I'll just say, I, I think I, I have a real interest to see how in this county can we build more relationships so that certain areas within the what gets identified as good things maybe in the resilience you know zone that they can be fast tracked or supported um, an example would be that we have a oops um, we've been trying to restart our farmers market but we've been in permitting land for uh, over four months and, and yet you know we have people setting up shop in town just kind of on the street and so like how do we bridge some of those gaps um, and, and fast track things like that thank you bennett heidi you have a minute go ahead hi um, i'm heidi hart i'm working with holly kii in kiara kikua and i'm probably going to be leaving around 10 and switching to my phone because today i'm teaching kapala making so the kk will be making leaves with a symbol to represent themselves, who they are and what they do. And we have a big tree that's gonna be painted and they'll be having a word cloud and a tree to represent like a kumula'au ola, the tree of life. So mahalo for all you've done. That's wonderful. Thank you, Heidi, for sharing. Thanks for joining us. Joel, you have a minute, go ahead. Aloha everyone, um, I'm Joelle and I work with Bennett at One Heart Hub and my role is Director of Programs and Social Impact. Um, I, we're currently participating with Partners in Development and supporting the funded KK Care Program with the idea that um, our other efforts around town um, and around our area will start to build up to kind of really 
evolve the resilient hub. Um, we are kind of scratching at the surface and well, a little bit more than that, but doing research and trying to figure out what are the needs. There's some areas that are coming up like the digital divide and access to technology. Um, North Kohala is leading in food and food systems and really trying to evolve that even more. And also looking at the area of, of um, the, breaking the cycle around addiction and incarceration with um, a really exciting um, ex oh, exchange with uh, Menapa'a. But anyway, Vibrant Hawaii energizes me. Um, I so thank all the organizers for doing this. Mahalo. Thank you. Great to see you. Danielle, you. you have a minute. Go ahead. There we go. Hi, I'm Danielle Bean with the Roberts Foundation. We're a private foundation that focuses on education and youth. Um, today, we are listening to see what the hubs are doing and hoping to be able to hopefully help in some area, fill the gaps, as a lot of people have said, the same kind of goals there. Um, we're here in Kona, so we focus on the west side. Um, so great, we see someone here with the Halaki'i hub and things like that. All right, just listening today. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks for being here as a support. We appreciate it. Um, Shari Ann. Aloha mai kako. I am Shari Ann Drummondo. Um, I'm here to listen today. We, um, I am from Kailapa Community Association here in Kauai High. And we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. So we're here to listen to see if it's something we will continue. Thank you, Thank you. Ashley. Thank you. And just so everyone knows, Shari is captain of the Kailapa Hub. They provide connectivity to community a couple of days a week and distribute restaurant prepared meals to folks in need. So thank you for joining us, Shari Ann. Um, Marsha? Good morning. Uh, I'm with the Nale Resilience Hub. I've spent most of my life in Kau. I my work experience is as an addiction counselor, case manager. I see myself as a weaver. I'm at my other is with the DOE Mobile Hub in Ocean View, and I do that a few days a week, and then go on to the Resilience Hub. So they really piggyback on each other. Uh, as you folks all know, uh, our problems on island are never ending. Uh, yesterday, we gave out 60 meals, which was the most we've done since we opened. Um, so I see the Resilience Hub as a definite leading force in moving forward and helping our community. Uh, I am Kapuna. I do work as we were and uh, on this call just to learn more today. Thank you. Thank you, Marsha. Megan? Hi, good morning. I work at the City and County of Honolulu Office of Climate Change, Sustainability, and Resiliency as an AmeriCorps VISTA. Uh, but I grew up in Kohala, so this hits close to home. Um, excited to learn more about what Hawaii Island is doing. Thanks for joining us. Noel? Hi, Ashley, it's Mario. Sorry about that. Oh, hey, what's up? <laughs> Go for oh, it. <laughs> uh, my name is Mario Dillon. I'm an AmeriCorps Vista at the research and the, in research and development at the Hawaii County. Um, I'll do also help Keiko with the work that she's doing. And right here, the introduction, I click support because I, from working on county support and also in, it's, Prioritize that Weaver between Weaver also interests or things, um, trying to learn more about what's going on on the island and what Vibrant Hawaii is doing. And I can connect people who I met that can also help out in, in ways. Beautiful. Thanks for joining us, Mario. I'm okay. Frank? Aloha, everyone. Uh, I'm Frank Kuo. Uh, I'm working at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. I'm the director of the counseling services. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we provide services to the students and uh, uh, 
I hope I can learn more uh, from here and maybe build up some relationship with the community and the university. Thank you. Thank you. I see another Danielle that's dialed in. No? Okay, no worries. Um, my name is Ashley Kirkowitz. I'm council member for District 4. I represent Laura Puna. Um, I was really interested in hub work because I was one of the founding members of Pu'uhonua Opuna, which literally like the next day after um, the, the Kilauea eruption happens in Lower Puna. Um, and that was an incredible experience of just pure grassroots community serving community being very nimble and resourceful and adapting. Um, and it's always been a vision and dream of mine to have these types of spaces in communities all around the island um, and to be mobilizing community to just spring into action and be a support based on what community needs. And so in researching the concept of resilience hubs, I found more information from the Urban Sustainability Development Network, USDN. And so a lot of the work that we as Vibrant Hawaii are doing in the space of resilience hub really looks to those tools from USDN. And so we use that to inform our work. Um, but obviously, Hawaii is very unique. All the communities around Hawaii Island across the state are all very unique. And so while that information from USDN is very helpful, um, we use it just to inform us because every community is special and needs um, you know, uniquely. And so very, very excited to be co-hosting these conversations and bringing people together uh, in this space so that we can learn and share from one another. All right, before we, um, before I turn it over to Keiko Mercado to provide us an update on general plan and CDP revisions, I just wanted to point out that our group meets every other week, um, every week actually, either to talk about resilience hubs or the update of our SEDS, that's the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. Uh, we meet Thursdays from nine to 11. Next week, we are gonna have a panel discussion on the industry of healthcare and wellness. Um, and then later on this month on the 29th, we'll have another meeting about resilience hubs that we'll talk about a little later. Really interested to hear from all of you on what other topics that you would like us to convene around. So with that said, I am going to turn it over to Keiko to present. Keiko, do you need me to share screen with you? Mahalo. Um, okay. Or give you host abilities? Yeah, that would be great. Then I can share screen. Um, so I introduced myself a little bit in the beginning. Um, I, I think I said this during the last meeting, but I see a lot of new folks on here, um, which is exciting. Um, so I am a long range planner in the planning department. And so our long range team doesn't do the typical things that you think of when you think of the planning department. So we don't process the permits. Um, <clears throat> we don't uh, comment so much on everyday process stuff, but we are kind of the big dreamers, um, policy changers, visionaries for the department. Um, let's see if I can share. And so excited to um, be able to provide you guys this overview. Um, it's, it's not getting deep into the weeds because it can get very deep into the weeds, um, but happy to talk story with folks um, anytime about about any of this. So uh, I was asked to talk about our general plan and our community development plans and how um, these are tied to some of the resilience hub work and different community efforts around the island. So our County of Hawaii's general plan is the blueprint that guides the long-term development of Hawaii Island. Um, it considers the needs of the entire island and provides a sound growth strategy that directs future opportunities related to land use, zoning, um, capital expenditures. And so the general plan strives to position Hawaii Island for economic progress while preserving the environment and strengthening community foundations. It is required by state law and county charter. And um, part of what we do, part of our kuleana as long range planners is to ensure that the purpose of the general plan is carrying out, making sure that the county um, all, that all public improvements, projects, and land use are consistent with the general plan. 
And so when um, special projects or permits come in, we check to make sure that these things are in alignment. <clears throat> and our community development plans are intended to translate the broad general plan goals, policies, and standards um, into implementable actions as they apply to specific geographical regions around the islands. And so what we think about most when we think about CDPs is that they're also intended to serve as a forum for community input into land use um, and the delivery of government services and any other matters relating to the planning area. So currently the general plan um, is undergoing a comprehensive review. And this began back in 2015. And we are fingers crossed, hoping that it'll be finalized in 2021. Um, community planning is relatively new to Hawaii County and part of the comprehensive review includes revision and updates to our community planning program, our CDPs. So in 2005, the GP authorized CDPs, but it didn't clearly define um, their authority, their structure, or how they would be implemented. And so after these, the CDPs were incorporated into the GP, four CDPs were launched, South Kohala, North Kohala, Puna, and Kona. Um, each of these became ordinances in 2008. And then in 2008, there was a amendment to the county code chapter 16 to include basic information on action committees who were tasked to implement the CDPs. Um, taking lessons learned from our 08 CDPs in 2017, um, Ka'u CDP was adopted. And then in 2018, Hamakua CDP became an ordinance as well. And so this um, comprehensive review process provided an opportunity for our action committees to play a large role in the GP process and help design um, the upcoming community planning program. So this timeline, um, this timeline shows some of the work that's been happening to incorporate our action committees into the general plan process. Our, our action committees are community folks who are active and working um, and have large networks within the communities. They are appointed um, by our mayor and they serve term different uh, number of years as terms. So typically it's four years, but at the start of an action committee, those things are um, staggered so that we're not overturning the whole committee at the same time. Um, so we started in 2015 with some initial input from action committees, hearing um, about what they saw as programmatic strengths and weaknesses. And then in 2016, action committee members and steering committee members who are driving Hamakua and Kau, the development of their CDPs, um, they participated in technical workshops and um, community meetings. And then in 2017, we began introducing a network approach to community-based actions and ways that we might be able to use opportunities within our networks to further CDP implementation. Um, significant to 2018 is of course the Kilauea eruption uh, with the recovery phase still ongoing. Um, so this allows us to take lessons learned from not only our action committees, but also from the task force that was set up um, for recovery. And we can, um, and especially as this task force is gonna be pivoting into implementation, um, which will affect not just the district of Puna, um, but the entire island. And so we can take these lessons learned and apply them towards this new planning program that, um, that's being created. Then in 2019, the draft of the general plan was released and our ACs um, put in a ton of work with review and public engagement. Um, and so we're recognizing the value of being able to work on implementation, implementation and capture lessons learned um, so that we can put together the most robust and meaningful CDP um, planning program <clears throat> that community has helped to design. 
So through the work in the GP comprehensive review and trying to understand the relationship um, between the GP and the CDPs, we've come to realize that the GP um, has the greatest influence over land use and infrastructure and the CDPs have the greatest influence over natural cultural resources and community placemaking. So we're really trying to focus our CDP work on where it has the greatest influence, um, but also being clear on what projects and initiatives can and should be community led and county supported and what kinds of community development projects need to be county led and community supported. Some of the frustrations that our action committees um, have felt is because we haven't um, clearly defined roles or there's not a clear understanding of what our roles are in each of our areas of Kuliana. Um, so this is our change process graphic. <clears throat> our CDPs were formed in different ways and with different strategy types. And over the years, this has caused um, some confusion and frustration around implementation. Um, but we're, we're determined to climb that ladder um, because <clears throat> or climb this mountain in front of us because, excuse me, taste of water. Um, as many of you <clears throat> mentioned, this um, collaborative work between community and county is essential to building resilient communities. Um, and so change is not easy and it's usually messy, um, but we know it's necessary. And so based on feedback and ideas from our action committees, we feel like we're kind of at this area of having a transforming idea because we kind of have a better idea of how clear we need to be about roles, what lanes everybody um, can work best in. And so we're excited to be able to put some of this to the test by beginning to work in a more collaborate networked fashion while still having time to collect additional lessons learned. Um, and being able to tweak aspects as we move along. So then, then comes COVID. And so we're using this <clears throat> um, quote to guide us because um, while it is a crisis, it is definitely an opportunity. And we're seeing this in the community and the work that you folks are doing. We're seeing it on the county side as we're trying to break down silos. So we have, um, we have this great opportunity. Um, and so we're, we're anxious to take advantage um, and make the most of it. So <clears throat> part, of, part of doing that is working outside of our typical silos, right? And this is critical to the successful implementation of our CDPs. There is great opportunity given our current circumstances and the resources that are coming into Hawaii Island. Um, and I think just knowing some of you folks and hearing your introductions, I think everyone on this call is here because we want to make a real fundamental difference that help our communities thrive, not just kind of a surface feel good kind of thing, but a systems change fundamental difference um, that can help our communities thrive, not only now during this time of COVID, but on and on and on into the future for our children's children and et cetera. So <clears throat> this is kind of how we're, we're trying to take advantage of this, um, this time right now. Um, well, the, the GP and the CDP, I can see in this gear here, um, they provide the driving authority Right, there are many different additional plans that secure funding um, and provide tools for implementation that are being leveraged so that projects and impacts can go even further. And so some of these plans are the Kilauea Recovery and Resiliency Plan and related to that is the Disaster Economic Recovery Plan, CDBGDR Action Plan, the Multi-Hazard Mitigation Plan and the Volcanic Risk Assessment. We also have um, the Climate Change Action Plan and our COVID-19 recovery. Um, and ongoing at the same time is our Hawaii Island Tourism Strategic Plan and then um, our SEDS and different things like that. And so how do we um, connect these things and so that all of our plans are working to provide us the greatest resiliency? Um, 
And so most of those plans are being managed either by planning or um, research and development. And so because connecting and implementing all of that stuff on the previous slide is so complicated, we needed a process that would connect it all together in a meaningful and ongoing way. So understanding that true engagement requires government institutions to sometimes lead by stepping back and creating space for residents to be involved as producers, um, it was necessary to determine three roles. So <clears throat> things that only residents can do, things that residents and institutions and government can accomplish together as co-producers, and then things that only institutions or government can do. Um, and so this graphic is depicting each of those roles, the blue at the top, um, sorry, my screen changed. Um, the blue at the top representing community initiatives, community driven initiatives, the green at the bottom representing county actions, and then the blended areas in the middle representing um, those things that need collective action. So comprehensively, we all county, community, we all need to build capacity. And one of the ways to do that is by engaging an intermediary who can provide real time technical assistance and um, help with connecting networks. So we're, we're working with our action committees um, to tie in these community actions and then also working with different community uh, county teams to tie in county actions. Um, so then, ta-da, Vibrant. Um, so my role as a planner is to facilitate county action, support action committee implementation um, of community actions, and serve as a bridge between community and government. Certainly not an easy role, um, especially when there are not many, um, many other county entities that serve this role or this purpose. Um, so it's one of the many, many reasons why um, I'm so excited and our team is so excited about resilience hubs. So as um, Ashley was saying, we were first introduced to re resiliency hubs um, in a recovery context, um, the Kilauea recovery context by Christian Baja from the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Um, and so being able to, um, talk with Ashley about this, these different efforts, we realized quickly that we needed to adopt a network approach to accommodate for our unique rural compositions um, because to have singular hubs was not gonna work for our, for our areas. Um, and so the Kilauea Recovery Community Engagement Team led by Bob Agris, who I'm sure many of you know, um, it seems no matter what room I'm in, people always have, um, brilliant things to say about Bob. And so we got to watch him and Ashley kind of, you know, ro toil with these conversations and figure out appropriate roles for community and for county um, and talk with the action committees and churches and um, even folks from the DOE to see how we could um, connect these, these ideas. And so this was done knowing that the county was not the right entity um, to lead the network of resilience hubs, but we knew that it needed to happen. And so we were ecstatic when Ashley and Vibrant brought the conversation to a larger island-wide table. I mean, this, this is a great example of community-led and county-supported. Um, but thinking about the future and sustaining the, longe the longevity of these initiatives, um, we think about data-driven resilience hubs. Uh, we know that CARES funding cannot be sustained but it's possible to pilot and codify this network approach to resilience hubs through something like the GP or the CDPs. Um, so these are still very early stages of thinking about this, um, but based on the CARES data that's being tracked currently, there is already a huge impact being made in our communities, an impact that can help build data-driven, resilient communities and ohana even when we aren't in the time of COVID, right? So how do we perpetuate this? 
some of the work that we've done more recently is gone through all of the CDPs um, and pulled out the community actions. So Kau and Hamakua CDPs have clearly outlined their actions. The older CDPs um, aren't as clearly defined, but we're still able to pull out actions that are community driven. And so what you see here are the cross cutting themes that span all of the CDPs. And the subtopics shown just speak to the variance of, of groupings. And so um, the variance of communities are the ways that these large cross cutting themes are pushed on and realized in each community is obviously unique. Um, and so during recovery engagement, we frequently reference the framing, Puna cannot be resilient if Hawaii Island is not resilient. And what this pushed on was not that Puna didn't have the largest unaddressed or heaviest impacted areas of the eruption um, and that they should get less attention, but that true resilience on an island means that all of us are connected and engaged and play a role in our own resilience. Um, so currently we are transitioning our action, action committee members to build and work more through their networks so that similar pro projects across the island can benefit from each other's lessons learned and lived genius. Um, we have a few issues uh, given that our action committees are governed by Sunshine Law. Um, and so sometimes that makes it difficult for them to uh, work together with, without, um, you know, within the confines of Sunshine Law. And so we're, we're still working to figure that part out. Um, and I know the font is super small on this uh, slide and I can share, I can share these slides post uh, meeting, um, but this just further shows the action types within each potential cohort or area of community action. And so important to note that just like all of our districts are connected on the island, these topics are also connected and intertwined together and we'll need to feed and inform each other and can't be worked on in silos. Um, so the network of resilience hubs is connected to many of these specific actions, especially when we think about them during non-COVID times. Um, and of course we can dig even deeper to identify specific community actions that are being implemented. Um, and I know this is, a lot of information um, in a very short span of time, um, especially for folks who maybe aren't familiar with the general plan or the CDPs. So more than happy to um, connect and talk story with folks anytime. Um, but I will unshare and see if anybody has questions. Keiko, that was wonderful. I've got a few questions and then I'm going to open it up to um, my co-chair Maggie uh, for just some reflections and some questions as well. Sure. Um, but I, you know, I'm just really curious. One of the slides that you presented was like that honeycomb blue on the mm -hmm. top for community actions, orange on the bottom for county actions. Are there specific examples that you can provide the group around what is something only community can do? What is something only county can do? And where is that collective action that we have to do together? Yeah, so I think um, one of the examples that we've been using is um, Frisha Savalos, who works out of um, research and development. She um, leads the, let's see, she leads the um, Hawaii Tourism Strategic Plan. And so part of what um, she's pushing for is since our, our MOKU has had this time to break from visitors, uh, we've seen a significant amount um, of restoration in anything from fish to foliage to um, bird. I mean, just uh, the impacts from tourism are pretty heavy on our island. And so what they're trying to do is um, engage folks around resilient visitors um, and regenerative tourism. And so she started these cohorts. And so it's taking groups of folks like um, Uncle Charlie, who helps to manage uh, Ho'okena Beach Park. And so that's a community-based program that caretakes for Ho'okena. They decide who, when, how, where, right? Um, but they run into some hiccups. Same, um, 
same for Kahalu Beach Park. Um, and so what Frisha is doing is trying to bring folks, connect them with folks from DLNR, with folks from Parks and Rec, um, to see if they can come to the table together and kind of work out some of these roadblocks or hiccups that they're, they're running into. Um, and so that's part of that, trying to figure it out together, part of it. And some of the stuff that only county can do is say on, um, on planning side is, you know, make code changes or amendments to uh, rules and things like that. You know, one of the things that Bennett had mentioned earlier was they were trying to get some permits for Kohala Village Hub and that, you know, permits are County Kuleana. Um, and I can really appreciate, you know, he and his team kind of really standing up a lot of really innovative initiatives very quickly. I mean, do you think it's within the county's wheelhouse and capacity to accelerate review of permits if there are things such as like what Bennett is doing that could have really amazing positive impact across many aspects of community? Mm. I would say that it probably depends on the departments um, that are involved. Um, but we have seen things move, I hesitate to use the word quickly, um, but depending on, I mean, so I can just speak in Pune, we've had different efforts. I mean, at one point we actually had to incorporate a farmer's market site into the general plan so that it would be quick and easy to operate. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that that's difficult and not easy to do. Yeah. Um, so depending on the circumstances, more than willing to talk story, Bennett, and see, see where we can plug in to help with that. For sure. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to think of, so after the eruption, I remember there was a county policy that said, you know, if you were impacted or dis displaced by lava, we were going to prioritize looking at your permitting requests and we're also going to waive right. fees. So in this time of a pandemic, if there are groups or individuals, businesses that are providing COVID response, maybe finding a way to kind of fast track um, their requests. But, mm -hmm. you know, also being very clear on the rules and parameters so that everybody is very clear on what their expectations are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm really curious because I chair planning and I'm very interested in this document. Can you provide us an overview of some of the big changes that we can see in the updated general plan um, and where your team kind of leveraged data uh, to make some of these changes? It can just be like high level overview kind of stuff. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things was realizing um, what should be housed in the general plan um, and what should be housed in the CDPs. And so cl clearly there are, are things in our CDPs that run up the gamut and uh, run across the island. And so those initiatives though, like public access, for example, um, each community has specific needs relative to public access, but it is definitely an overarching need for our entire island. And so how do we, um, codify that in a way that makes sense that the each community can then have their input and say into that. Um, I don't, I can, um, trying to think of other specifics. Um, like in terms of like land use, are there any big surprises for different regions? Um, I don't think any big surprises. Um, but we'll be coming back out with land use maps once those are, I think Pune is the only area um, that did not have maps when we went out to the larger public um, back in the summer of 2019. Mm -hmm. um, but that um, should be coming out soon. And so we'll do outreach for that. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then in terms of being data driven, you're leaning on things like the census. I mean, what sort of like fancy technological things are you using to kind of project where population is going to grow? Um, and like infrastructure investments that we need to make um, mm -hmm. in order to meet the needs of the growing population. So we had some, um, mm, I can't remember the name of it now and they've changed their name, but we contracted um, to run kind of these um, development patterns or, so we know that we have, um, let's see, I'm trying to find the actual data here, sorry. So we know that our existing zoning rights on our island already allow for enough homes for 852,000 people. That's over four times our population, 852. 
maybe that's yeah um and housing count today so how do we concentrate growth in the areas that have infrastructure and where it's easy for folks um, and so that we don't continue this spread um, that cuts into uh, natural resources and um, areas that might be impossible to get infrastructure. And so there was, I, can't, I'm just, I apologize, I can't remember the name of the program. Community Viz, mm. there it is. Um, yeah, so based on real property information, zoning information, they ran these um, programs to see. And then those were, those were um, turned into maps and then were taken out to community for comment. Very but, cool. Yeah. Um, you know, and in, in thinking about resilience, that's, you know, the buzzword that we're all kind of adopting and infusing into our work now. How, how is this general plan weaving in the concept of resilience? The fact that we are experiencing more natural disasters, more intensely, more frequently. I mean, I feel like that sort of kind of is in the back of your mind as you're updating the general plan um, and where you put in infrastructure and the kind of infrastructure even, right? Wanting to make sure that it withstands all of these disasters um, so that communities can quickly bounce back or bounce forward, right, post-disaster. Mm -hmm. So how is resilience weaved in? Yeah, so part of, part of it is um, the work that we've been trying to do with the other departments. Um, this is the first time actually that so our current general plan was adopted in 2005. And this is the first time that our general plan is actually being updated mostly in-house. And so um, while we did bring in different contractors for things, it allows us to have this, um, a different lens than say a contractor um, brought in from the mainland US. And so it allows us to have this um, lens and it allows it to be easier for us to work with the other agencies. And so that's part of it is understanding what other agencies um, need and how they think about resiliency relative to their areas of expertise, um, but also being able to draw from the CDPs because our communities have shared extensively what resilience means in their communities. And so how do we lift up what we can into the GP and then uh, create a, a community planning program that can even further um, strengthen what the communities are asking for and needing. So Keiko, you mentioned um, community actions mm -hmm. and then how, because the ACs are bounds by Sunshine Law, it kind of gets in the way of community action committees like meeting. So is there any thought around kind of reframing what the makeup or you know framework of these groups are like so that communities can actually act? Um, and then, you know, are we creating tools for them to kind of implement? What do you yes. um so yeah, we're I am recently um reeling after a set back by sunshine law. And so I'm still fussy about it um, because we, we thought we had this great way of actually engaging community and getting action um, done, but our attorneys tell us that it's not possible at this moment. So um, really just trying to figure out how, how we can not get in the way. And sometimes, um, sometimes our action committee members um, join action committees because maybe they think it gives them leverage for something, um, but they don't really, they aren't really active in the communities, right? And so how do we educate them and work with them um, to understand their role as communicators, as networkers, as people who drive action and lead and inspire community? Um, so a lot of it is capacity building. And so if we could build, if we could work on capacity building, not only with community members on our action committees, but also for county ourselves, because this is also new to most, most of us in the county, right, is how to, um, how to balance, balance the voices. 
you know, when you think about capacity building, what Vibrant Hawaii has been able to do in the last couple months in activating a network of over 30 hubs around mm -hmm. the island, I mean, it's like all consuming, but it has been such an incredible experience to work directly with community where we've been able to challenge assumptions, right? And shift those deficit narratives and just show people that there's so many different things that you can be leveraging right in your community yeah. to make this work. And so I got really excited when you mentioned codifying hubs in some way or shape or form via ordinance, you know, within our code or within the general plan. So are you able to kind of speak to that a little bit because so many of our community members are so excited about being able to provide connectivity and space for community to convene. And I think going forward right now that this foundation of hub networks is available, these can be spaces of economic development. We can Absolutely. have meetings, we can have certified kitchens, we can have pop-up makeke, it can be anything that community needs. And so yeah. just really curious how we can continue to make all this stuff happen and support community recognizing that we've got a major budget deficit that we're facing as community and state. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't have an actual answer to that <laughs> at this point. Um, the conversation is very new and it's because we're seeing all of this, um, all of this stuff that's happening. Right. And so how do we, so that's how the conversation started was how do we ensure that this can continue post COVID because while the role is important in COVID, it's even more important in our everyday lives. Um, and folks are doing amazing things, things county would never be able to imagine or do. Um, and so how, what is our role in supporting that? And so that conversation of how we can codify is fairly new. Um, so open to any thoughts or ideas okay. about about that yeah for sure so one of the slides that you mentioned so my last question i'm going to shift mm -hmm. to maggie one of um the things i was thinking about as you were listing plans under kilaway recovery and response mm -hmm. was a multi-hazard mitigation plan there was some federal funding that came through specific to multi-hazard mitigation about seven million dollars um and so i'm wondering if this is maybe a pot of money that resilience hubs could tap to start yeah. Right. I, I'm just trying to align the tools that we have, but maybe they can tap that bucket um, in 2021 to still, you know, provide community support, but under the lens of, you know, hazard mitigation. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, that's no, that's that's awesome. I mean, that's kind of how we talk about these other plans in a way is that they're actually grant applications. And so they provide framework for us to be able to pull on grant money. And yeah, that's. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you, Keiko. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you both. And Ashley, as, as usual, you cover everything beautifully. <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, one of the things uh, for me personally, as co-chair of Resilience Hubs, but as a member of District 7 and here in Kona, with this team, Holikii Hub, that really, in a matter of two months, converted a BISAC warehouse that was unfinished to a beautiful space for over 50 keiki with individual plexi protected space for each of them. They're, they're up and running as of yesterday and I can step back and have the big picture view again. But I think one of the main things for me has to be reestablishing this trust within the community. I think we all know that you know the current model and the systemic um, change that is required needs to happen from a, a, a standpoint of shifting deficit narratives as we've been talking about, but also allowing the mental models to emerge to inform decision-making on the policy level where we can then remove barriers. There's much more going on in the grand scheme of things as well. And as we mentioned that this is basically modeled off after the uh, Urban Sustainability Development Network's um, response to climate change. The last few weeks, I've also sat uh, through the convention with the National Lawyers Guild and the International Environmental Committee's report back was all but just devastating in terms of what, there are zero plans to shift what is happening. All the plans are to create resilience. And in 10 years, basically we can expect complex disasters. We should be, we're seeing sort of the start of it now, but you think about COVID on top of hurricanes, on top of you know everything else that you can think of, it's gonna start happening. So one of the things that, you know, on a, on a grassroots level, 
even driving 20 minutes towards Ho'okena, we notice a whole different community and, and what their needs are. And there's also such a mistrust of government and authoritative figures that a lot of times it's even Hawaiian and Hawaiian racism. And it's all, all of this different stuff going on that needs to be addressed at the center, which is really helping people to understand that everyone is useful and that they all can bring something to the table that we can leverage to better the community. So one of the things that I've been doing just in my own community is just showing people that just by leading by example, this is how we operate out of abundance. And so when a natural disaster or something complex does happen, it's not as though everyone's looking to the hubs as somewhere they can come to get, but it's somewhere that they go out of their abundance because they have gardens in their backyards, because they've been a part of renewable energy systems and they have things that they can offer. We switch into the FEMA incident command systems like this because it's so back in the mind that we all know what color vest to put on. We all know what to do and how to respond. Preparing for that adaptive capacity is so important and having everyone at the table to provide a seat and really looking too at international humanitarian law because these are things that are affecting, you know, the affordable housing and all of these other things play a role. And I feel like hubs can provide the seat where all streams can converge and have a place where then from that location can go out into their communities and say, hey, this is what we have to offer. You know, and I think that developing software around allowing folks to create their profiles and say, hey, this is what I do, and then auto-populate with everyone that could potentially be your tribe to make those things happen, because it does have to be able to convert and happen quickly. So I, I don't want to take too much time, and I want to hear from the community, but I want to let everyone know that, you know, beyond CARES grant money, I think it's really important. And for our team with Halakii, obviously, I mean, we've developed the business plan based on on the RFP and basically moving this forward with a vision of how do we monetize it? How do we you know, ad adapt and, and allow economy and different industry to merge out of this? How do we create mental models and blueprints that can be exported as knowledge and sold to other island nations that face similar kind of uh, difficulties that we may be facing? So um, it's something that I think all hands on deck in this time and I sense such an urgency as well um, the only questions I have for Keiko is how can we help the county to understand and to move forward and to be the role that it needs to be. Um, you know, as a surety agent, I'll tell you, just with dealing with the courts that are on a state level, the, 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 the stations and the police departments that are on a, a county level, and then HCCC, I mean, it's a, it's a mess, to be quite frank. But everyone, I think the redefining of roles and allowing people to understand that this concept that Vibrant Hawaii has brought forth over the last year in terms of we're all in our own boats. We're not saying everyone, hey, come get in our boat. We're going in the right direction. We're saying, hey, stay in your boat. This is the North Star. This is the Vibrant Hawaii that our community has informed us that is the goal. Let's all paddle our hardest towards this direction and see what we can do when great minds come together. I'll give you one example. You know, CARES funding does not cover capital improvements. And there were a ton of capital improvements needed to get this Halakiki hub off the ground. As a bail bondsman also, I've been able to work through Friends of the Children nonprofit and allow folks with, with pretty uh, extensive hours required to do some community service, you know. And this plays along the lines of everyone is useful, right? You don't walk into a place and just because someone's changing the garbage or scrubbing the floors, treat them like they're lesser than. Everyone is on the same level. And that's the way that we've approached this the entire time. We have over 400 hours up to this point of community service. And when I realized from the, the, the individual that helped Biosac build out that um, facility, that the upper floor where we were gonna do the learning lab was unfinished, it was enough for me to say, nope, this will shut it down if we don't get this finished. I will not allow it just as a risk mitigator. You know, it's not going to happen. The volunteer overheard and she bought the entire floor for the whole, that's a, that's a huge space. She put thousands of dollars in of her own money and myself and my partner who used to work for Guy Mueller over here building these fancy homes, we laid the entire floor in one day. 
It's just an amazing example of what can happen when community comes together. So Resilience Hub is a proof of concept, is wonderful. The data and the, the gaps that we'll be able to measure out of this can really inform the grant writing process. Where there's vision, there is provision. And that's just a matter of fact, it's a principle. And what we have here is something so special. So I really encourage everyone to just plug in where you fit in and no, you know, don't hold back. There's no shame. This group is really here with a heart to help. And I just encourage everyone moving forward. It is my, I'm doing this completely in kind and completely in kind this first phase. And it's something that's so dear to me. It's really a bigger picture in terms of resource management systems. We have to recognize that the norm has been the crisis and we need to all put our minds together to flip this on its head and allow Hawaii to shine not only brightly for our entire state, but as an island nation for the world, because there are water crises around the world. There are unspeakable things that we don't even know about because we are very privileged here. I'm sure Devin, you know, I met with Devin the other day and he's been an environmental teacher around the world. They just came back from Kenya. You know, we have access here that we can leverage the brilliance of our community and work together when we look past our individual barriers within our own mind. So this all starts with ourselves as individuals rising up on the inside. And I'll tell you, the vibrant Hawaii principles that were birthed in the beginning were all informed from the community convenings. Our leadership team spent a night up in Kohala hashing it out, tears included. And this is all about a personal growth process that then shines from the inside out and all of us together can do amazing things. So I just wanna encourage everyone. I don't have too many questions. I am informed by this conversation and I would love if Peiko could share that slide. My connectivity is horrible today. I'm trying to allow my daughter to do her school and I'm on my little phone right here. So I apologize if anything um, is a little glitchy, but that's pretty much all I have for now. And I just thank everyone for being on the call and uh, joining in this effort with us. It has been, um, amazing. And I don't know how we've all had our energy. I think it's just been out of the air because literally five hours of sleep. If I get that at night, I'm like, great, let's get up and go, you know? And so now that we've paddled really hard off the line, I feel like we're all able to sort of ease back and see what this is going to bring. I mean, in three weeks, we've already distributed over 6,000 meals. This is, you know, this is an amazing amazing example of what can be done when grassroots community are provided the opportunities to reflect their intelligence and their brilliance within within um, our island. So thank you all so much. And thank you for the Outer Islands for joining us as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Maggie. That was beautiful. Um, I do want to open it up at this time to folks that are joining us on the Zoom um, for any questions for Keiko or reflections on today's conversation. I'm gonna call on people then. I would love to hear from Keone because he has grassroots experience in responding to community disasters as he shared with the Kauai flood. Um, but just really curious about, you know, the work that you're doing right now with Kanu Hawaii and how we can be building up a resilient, you know, state of Hawaii. Uh, yeah, mahalo uh, everyone. And uh, I, I just became aware of this effort. I know Vibrant Hawaii has been like warp speeding, like, solutions, but I think that's built upon many, many years and decades of relationships and experience and you guys are coming together and organizing. It's amazing. Um, so uh, congrats, kind of looking to see how you guys are bridging the government community gap because in all the work I've done, that seems to be the one point that um, every uh, community side folks run up against. There's the politically correct uh, response, you know, that has to take into consideration staying in office. And then there's also the actual community response, which many times moves a lot more quickly and uh, can create kind of exposure for, for political folks. Um, so they have to kind of back into it and, and be careful. And so I think that's one of the biggest points I'd really love to figure out, how, you know, or, or learn from you guys on how are you navigating that part of it? And um, it sounds like you are. Uh, I think uh, just from my experience, a couple of points, I'm, I'm, I am curious how you guys are, you know, go up, I looked at the mapping, kind of uh, the resilience hubs and the Keiki hubs and the, you know, these different sections are um, different efforts. And I did a little bit of research after the 2018, kind of 2019 timeframe. And 
visited the, the uh, Hawaii Island and interviewed some folks that were involved with community response. Uh, went to Maui, did the same, same on Kauai, same on Oahu. And um, what I noticed is in all those cases, the responding uh, organizations or entities were many times not the ones that you would think were the ones that were supposed to or were going to respond to an emergency. And in many cases, they weren't brick and mortar locations. They were all stand up sites that were done on the fly and every system had to be created almost from scratch. Um, so I am wondering how you're making the transition to more of a stand up or like a brick and mortar kind of site and what are some of the prerequisites that you guys are building into that? I mean, from my work, um, there's a lot of funding and uh, energy and high level stakeholders involved in kind of the emergency response side, but not in the sustainability side of things, right? But they're the same thing. Um, one is proactive, one is reactive. And so, you know, building resilience hubs or emergency response hubs that actually meet our needs for community economic development, food, um, production and distribution, um, communications, medical, uh, triage, um, energy, uh, providing energy to community to power mobile devices or other things in a, in a gap period. I mean, those are all strong points, you know, places that have a medevac site or a place that's at a high kind of um, uh, uh, elevation to stay away from flooding and hurricanes. It's not in a wind corridor. So I'm just kind of, I mean, there's a lot of questions, probably not going to get to them on this call, but I'm really kind of interested in the logistics and kind of the, how are you selecting sites and, and what, how far ahead are you guys thinking? Are you just working with low hanging fruit and people who are ready to step up? Um, are, is it a transitional strategy? Like, I, I don't know, I got too many questions, honestly, to, <laughs> to have answered, but I'm very interested in what you guys are doing and really appreciate being involved in, in the conversation. So. Johnny, if I could just answer maybe your second question, because I think navigating the political arena is just a really, it's a very, it, we're going to, we're going to need a pauhana for that one. Okay. We're going to need a pauhana for that one. But in terms of the work that we're doing right now to res provide emergency response with the CARES funding, um, you know, through Vibrant Hawaii, we put out a community wide call literally two days after the RFP came out or before it came out, had a Zoom. There were like over 70 people on the call from all over the islands. I mean, I think I let 15 people know and it just kind of, there was just this tsunami of response that came through because people are like, we really appreciate this concept and wanting to be empowered with resources and government get out of the way, right? That's what you got to do. Empower community, government, make it easy, get out of the way. And so when we initially submitted our proposal, we only had like 17 sites around the island, um, but over time with our budget and because the county took a little bit longer to get us you know, the, the funding, we were able to bring on more sites. So the map that Keiko shared in her deck um, only reflects what we had earlier, just maybe like about a month ago. And so we've got over 30 sites that are responding. Um, if people had a space and what we tried to do was leverage county spaces like parks and rec facilities, um, different community centers. I mean, we've got a freaking train museum as one of our hubs in Lapahoy Hoy. So any kind of space can be retrofitted to serve whatever community has identified need, is a gap that needs to be served. And so not all hubs are the same. Some are open every single day. Some are just open a few days a week. Some are kicky hubs where parents can drop their kid off They'll get breakfast, lunch, and or take home dinner. Um, they are provided adult supervision to connect to internet because maybe they live in a place that doesn't have connectivity or they don't have a device at home. So these spaces, they're allowed to do the, complete their virtual learning. And then there's also enrichment experiences. One hub we're sending uh, yoga instructors to so that kids can understand how to take care of their body, breathing exercises, do those kinds of things. We've got the honeybee education program that's going to hubs all around the island to talk about how you plant your own pollinator garden so that you can be food sustainable at home and for your neighborhood. We're also giving people like ulu trees. So it's we put out a call and people that had capacity or an idea and the wherewithal to act, they came forward. And they're part of this network. I think we're really, really inclusive. Um, and we just try to work with folks in terms of where they're at. So that's, and it's been kind of happening, like you say, at warp speed, because we only have until the end of the year to spend on all this funding. And so it's been, it's been really, it's been tricky. 
it's been tricky um, to be dealing with a lot of different entities at different capacities, but I think so far, so good. You know, our hugs, our hugs have been activated. We're pushing out restaurant prepared meals every single day in communities around the islands. And that is a concept that we absolutely love because then we can know money is staying in community. Um, every hub is pushing out food. And the food that's purchased is made by a restaurant in that community. And those restaurants buy from local farmers and other producers. That way, every dollar we spend, we can really ensure is having that you know, local impact. So that's, that's kind of our effort in a nutshell. I would love to connect with you to answer more in-depth questions if you have them. Maggie, I don't know if you want to weigh in at all. Nope, that was great. Yeah, and and I would point him to our Vibrant Hawaii website, um, vibranthawaii.org, and under the economy stream, there are resources there where you can learn and see what um, we've modeled a lot of our efforts off of in terms of being informed by the USDN um, and local community and gain the overall um, big picture there. Yeah. And then I don't know if folks notice in the chat, but Janice, our executive director, she just wanted to point out, and I think it's great, right? When you think about what are hubs, we've got a couple of churches that do serve as hub spaces. And we also have a 3D printing program that's being offered to hubs around the island. So a lot of community genius that we're able to elevate and connect people to. Any other questions or comments for Keiko or for today's conversation? I just, if I may say something, um, Keiko, I loved how you said um, about breaking down the silos and um, because silos have been the bane of my existence. I've been working in the social services for, you know, over two decades and I've worked for programs where, you know, even though we're the same agency, um, and I've worked for programs where we're on the same team and the head didn't know what the tail was doing, you know, because I don't, for whatever reason. And, but to not, I, I just think it's so important that, you know, various, I love how you guys do the polls at the beginning to really get a feel for the different, um, uh, I don't know, aspects of the community that are engaging in this. Because, you know, as a social worker representing the social services and contracting with child welfare, like that's only one piece, right? And without say education and, you know, health and wellness, um, you know, my own program can't work on resilience on its own. It's vital that we get together and, you know, know what each other is doing and learn from each other as well. So I just, I love that that is part of the whole model of this. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Um, while uh, Keone was talking, I was just thinking about, um, I mean, right now, and I don't want to I feel like Marsha should talk about the hub in Na'alehu because she's the person there, but currently it's at the Hoanji, but where my office is, it's in a strip mall where there's the only supermarket in Na'alehu has been closed down for years now. And um, it's a big space. And I was, while Keone was talking, I was thinking how it, you know, it could be this amazing space that for the community, there's a lot of options, actually. It's a matter of asking the community what they want. Do they want another supermarket? Do they want, I don't know, an MMA gym? Because, you know, I mean, I think people, there are so few extracurricular opportunities for kids in that area. And I also think sometimes it's people from the mainland coming and offering something that somebody from the mainland thinks is beneficial, but never asking the community and the people from that area what they want or what they think will, you know, what kind of activity they want their kids to engage in. Um, so I liked how you brought that up about the shift to brick and mortar. I guess my question is how this continues. I mean, did you put in another RFP for 2021? Like how does this continue financially at, after December? Yeah, so I mean, unfortunately the, the funding stream that we have rely on the CARES Act grant. And so the deadline to not only encumber but spend every single dollar um, is December 30th. 
And so we're kind of time bound and limited in terms of like serving, which is why, you know, earlier I asked Keiko, can some of the multi-hazard mitigation funding be shifted to support resilience hubs? My brain about what are some other other plans that have funding available that can be leveraged to support hubs. One, one for instance, is um, within our comprehensive economic development strategy. And so I'm kind of jumping ahead here. Um, but the SEDS is a document that we're mandated to do as a county and state. And these are like regional economic development plans where we we identify as a community what economic sectors we would like to lift up in our regions. And why that's important is because there's a huge bucket of funding available on the federal side from the Economic Development Alliance. And because our state has experienced a number of disasters in the last few years, our typical $3 million allocation for um, annual allocation for the region, um, you know, there's so much more than that. It's over, it's over $100 million that is available for economic development. And so just thinking about some of the hubs that are further along, such as Bennett's Kohala Village Hub, they could be a candidate that could potentially submit a grant to obtain funding um, to keep their hub going with that economic development component. So at this point in the game, we have to take stock of all the different buckets of money that are available. And depending on where a hub is at in terms of, um, you know, its capacity and its development, then we can match the appropriate funding stream to it. But it's a, it's a huge orchestration. <laughs> And, you know, we're certainly going to be relying on our philanthropy community to kind of help fill in the gap where possible. I'll just speak up just what a second Roni's observation around, you know, the, I think in the nonprofit world, funders are looking for uh, hui style grants and uh, and certainly the resilience hubs uh, reflect that there's this willingness to come together. And so I, I just I just perceive that uh, the challenge for our, our government, our state and county government is to look at its siloing and 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 you know to move into these new possibilities like how, how to do that because as the response was, you know, it can't really help fast track things, I think because of all the partitions. And, and there's power structures, there's all that comp complexity. And I do, I, I'm not, it's not, I'm, I don't want this to be a critique, but it's, but I think that's the opportunity here maybe is, is to, to, to lean into that a, a little more and see if there's a way to, you know, have county or, or, or state government, you know, cooperate more with itself and, and find ways, new ways of doing things. Thanks, Bennett. That's absolutely a shared feeling. Um, just on a side note, it doesn't have to do with hubs, but you know, as planning committee chair, we've gotten nearly like 30 different applications for time extensions um, to complete different projects. And it's because there are so many different hoops for um, you know, developers and folks to kind of jump through. Um, and so it's in the hands of not just county, but like even state agencies, like State Historic Preservation Division. The first application I got during in planning committee, they had been waiting seven years for a response from that agency, which is just ridiculous. I mean, this is where businesses are, you know, developments kind of come to die, really. Um, and so we not just have an opportunity, but I think an obligation to do better. Um, hey, Chris from Oahu, did you want to kind of talk story about, you know, what you folks are doing in terms of creating that hub strategy for Oahu and maybe even reflecting on some of what you've heard and learned of today? Certainly. Um, so uh, just a little more background on me. Uh, my, my title is the Hazard Mitigation Program Manager. Uh, so at Hazard Mitigation and Long-Term Disaster Recovery. So. Um, the Resilience Hubs Action Plan is one of the projects that I'm working on, and I mentioned uh, that we were able to leverage some FEMA hazard mitigation funding to do that. And the way that we did that was we looked at one specific element. Uh, Kaoni mentioned uh, some of the concerns around hubs uh, being disaster resilient, and so I, I sort of honed in on that. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons. One is all of those uh, the wonderful social services and things that everyone has talked about that's that's getting far outside of my area of expertise 
Um, whereas if you're talking about structural retrofits for disaster uh, resilience, that's right in the middle of my area of expertise. And it also um, is eligible for the FEMA hazard mitigation funding, which is a big concern, you know, when you're trying to uh, ultimately string together uh, what I will call a quilt of funding to accomplish anything. Uh, it's uh, the, the primary uses of that funding and, and what's eligible um, really is, is a big concern. Uh, so what the, uh, the way that I sort of put together the grant application was to focus in on uh, to do some community engagement, uh, to identify some potential sites, and then to get to uh, what might be needed to allow um, those sites to operate during disaster. And so this is this is obviously dates back to pre-COVID, and so we were thinking of things like hurricane. Um, there's also a model uh, currently underway on the, the North Shore here on Oahu um, in the town of Paula. Um, and they are looking at uh, a potential site. They have a, a, a risk of being uh, isolated uh, because there's a single road access point, which is probably a familiar story uh, for some of your communities as well. Um, so we, we are tying it to the multi-hazard mitigation plan. Um, ultimately, what we're looking for are retrofit projects that can become projects in the multi-hazard mitigation plan. Um, and the, the hazard mitigation plan is uh, tied to, to the general plan as well as uh, we have uh, both development plans and sustainable communities plans on Oahu, but it's a very similar uh, concept to the development plans uh, Keiko described. So um, it really is uh, exactly what you talked about here. We're, we're trying to take advantages, focus on the assets, focus on what strength we have out there and look for ways to move forward. We know it's going to be unique uh, to each community. Obviously, what uh, is going to need to happen in Waikiki is going to be much different than what needs to happen in the country. Um, so uh, it's exciting. It's early in the process. Actually, my funding is still pending award. So uh, I don't actually have it yet, but I'm, I'm confident that it's coming. It's just working its way through the, the FEMA process, which is slow. They'll tell you that up front. Um, but yeah, I encourage you, if you're, if you're interested to see the, the genesis of the project, uh, it's in our resilience strategy, which you could, uh, is on our website, resilientoahu.org. Um, and it's uh, action number 15. And I'm happy to email, uh, provide that to you as well. So I'll, I'll drop my email in the chat. So thanks for having me today. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for, for joining us and contributing. Um, does anybody else want to share? I'm also really interested to hear from all of you in terms of other topics that you would like to convene around. I hope that, Keiko, you'll come back to us in 2021 to give us an update on where we are with the, the next, you know, the, the new drafts of the general plan. Um, but until then, We've got other, you know, other things that we can meet around. So just curious as to what folks would like to learn more about. Just wanted to share that we'll be back before that um, okay. because, you know, to Maggie's question of how do you folks get involved? Um, mm -hmm. When we're ready to come back to community with this updated draft based on all of the community input prior and agency input, um, we're definitely coming coming to you folks and going to ask that you folks provide comment and that you share it within your networks um, so that we can we can tap into all of the genius that surrounds us. So mahalo. Thank you. Hey, Ash, can you guys, I was going to add that if there is a lot of um, questions and interest in understanding um, the value of um, community response to disasters and how that relates to reporting for FEMA and what kind of supports are there and, and things like that. Um, I'm sure there's some really great resources within the county, but Daryl also has a lot of experience in that. Um, and I think he does a really good job of managing expectations. Um, because sometimes the, the story that gets told through marketing of it and then the reality of the money that actually comes down is two very different things. And I think from what I um, 
know the community really appreciates knowing what the real deal is, not what the pie in the sky under perfect conditions, what it will be like. And um, yeah, I think Daryl does a really good job of that. So if there's an interest, you could reach out to him. Yeah, absolutely. That might be something we can slot in for October 29th if folks aren't opposed. Um, thank you, John. Thanks for offering Daryl up. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts on what you folks would like to learn about as it relates to Resilience Hubs and how we can support your work? You know, another thing that Janice and I also wanted to do was spotlight some of the resilience hubs that are operating on our island. So this might be an opportunity for us to showcase Bennett Dorrance and the work that they're doing in Kohala. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we hosted Robert Golden. He is starting sort of like a virtual resilience hub to put information out and to get, you know, people better connected. So we've got like you've all recognized a lot of community genius here on islands that we definitely want to showcase. So feel free to chime in in the chat or just unmute yourself and let us know. So okay. I would be really interested in hearing from Bennett about the work they're doing. I think that might also marry really well if we invited um, Jenny and the Honeybee program to um, share a little bit on that because I think from the little I know about the two that they are complementary in, in their um, purpose and passion of wanting to empower community, not only of, of providing a resource, but of providing an, an opportunity for education. I'll speak up and I don't know if Joelle is still on, but um, you know, I, I would just say that we, we've had this idea of a hub for some years. It was pre-COVID uh, that we've been working on this and you know, we've created space where we, we were slowly building more activity for the community. Um, but since, uh, since COVID has kind of put us on this fast track of, of like, you know, how do we, what do we do here and, and how do we have an impact? Um, and it's really, it's a gradual process of learning. Um, honestly, some of the more recent activities are actions that, that we learn from the other hubs through Vibrant. We're like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. So the networking has been uh, crucial. Um, we were wanting to take a deeper dive with the community, um, asking and, and really leaning on, on PID and our partners in development and Vibrant to, um, to further ask into the community to, you know, to see the needs, but also to kind of build, build a vision, uh, kind of a systemic based vision. And, and one of our main feedbacks, which I, I was not surprised so far is just not another survey. Because uh, our 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 community has been taxed, you know, year decade after decade. There's a lot of ideas, and you know, the CDP's really stuck around, which has been great. Um, but but I, there's a burnout there. So um, we're having a right now. We're having an interesting uh, initiative where we're really interested in creating a media hub for um, for the community. But we really wanted to ask the community first: Did they want that? So uh, in order to kind of break that. Um, chicken and the egg. Uh, we're looking at doing a series of workshops where we'll be, uh, and we're learning that, you know, we have a lot of talent out there that's just sitting at home who can teach about how to do a better uh, Instagram, you know, how, how do you build your Instagram presence or your, uh, you know, uh, was it, I'm not the tech person, uh, Facebook or um, anyways, getting into these areas and creating smaller opportunities and that'll generate maybe in, we'll see what the interest is and we'll see where that goes. So we might take that idea and, and apply it further into other initiatives, you know, around food, um, resilience and things like that to just start, we'll, we'll, we'll have to test it out and see, but, you know, reaching into the community and um, getting better feedback and, and building more vision, like more detailed vision beyond vibrant is really, we feel like is our main challenge right now. And, and trying to find a way to do that. Thanks for sharing that, Bennett. And I have mm -hmm. to agree with you. I think people are taxed when it turn, when it comes to sharing Manao. They're like, oh my God, not this again, right? I thought I told you how I felt like 80 times. <laughs> um, but that's, that's very interesting. I think that's something for Vibrant Hawaii to really think on. 
Um, I think if people, I think people would be willing to give their mana'o if they know it's going to connect to something they see in progress already. So if the survey is around resilience hubs, which are currently activated around the island, I think people would be more willing to contribute because it's something that they see and are likely benefiting from or have something to contribute to. So let's definitely talk story about how we can engage our community around those things. Anyone else have some parting mana'o? Um, just quickly, Bennett, I wanted to share. So our action committee in North Kohala is very um, small and they don't have enough members to meet quorum and there is burnout. Um, and so it's hard to get interest. Um, and part of that comes from the frustration of roles and non-implementation and things like that. Um, but so I, I would love to be able to be in contact with you. Um, and should we, so even for, you and for um, Ronit and I'm trying to uh, Marsha is the other one in Kau. Um, these are the areas where we really want to engage with community folks who are working on efforts um, that are implementing our CDPs. And so, if we can connect with you, that would be fabulous. So we can see how we can support you, and um, yeah, vice versa. Great, thank you. Sorry, Ash. No, that's wonderful. Thanks, Keiko. We provide the space for connecting and convening. It's what we do. Thank you. Anyone else? This has been such a wonderful conversation. And Devin, I, I just wanted to note, you mentioned earlier having a lot of experience in the education space and wanting to do more INA-based um, things. And so I'd love to connect you with our education stream. Um, one of the one of the substreams that they have is around learning outdoors. And so I think you would you would find that to be a really interesting and joyful group to collaborate with. And we also convene as economy and education every other week to talk about um, economic development and how we can build up that workforce pipeline. Thank you very much, Ashley. And, and once again, thank you for uh, allowing me to be a part of this this discussion. I and I learned in the last three decades of teaching is that uh, you learn a lot more by listening than talking. So I, I really appreciate everybody's input and thank you for, uh, for that education. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. It's great to see all of you. Please stay in touch and take care. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you very much.